Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Echelon Cycling Podcast, where three cycling nerds discuss what's been happening in the week of cycling and also look with an eye to the events ahead, because speculation is fun. As always, I'm joined by Mr. Critical himself, Ewan Wilson, with, with an amazing t-shirt, and Patrick Blake of Audu Cycling somewhere in the Lake District as well. So, I mean, guys, how's the week been? And I mean, a lot of racing to get through once again, so we have got a packed agenda, to say the least. Despite the fact none of us live in the Lake District, this podcast has had a number of Lake District <laughs> in the past That's year. True. I think yeah. I've recorded two episodes there. Patrick's been there. Well, Patrick is there now, so it's yeah. like we've uh, we've definitely done a lot for the tourism industry. So um, if the mayor of the Lake District, I know there isn't one, but if there is a mayor or a tourism board and they want to offer um, us, us a promotional deal. Pay for our studio to be in the Lake District. Yeah, yeah I have all pretty cool. I was actually, I had a bit of nostalgia today, so I went up Win Lotter Pass. And do you remember when the Tour of Britain actually made good routes and sent a team time trial up there? And then it just made me sad because I thought, wow, it's so rubbish now. But anyway, that is the, enough of that's already me losing track. Uh, 30 seconds in and the Tour of Britain yeah. is getting bashed already. Already. Classic. I mean, this, this week, it's just been so busy. There's been... Like, if you're somebody who's following racing, there's been, like, six results popping up a day. There's been Provence, which Pedersen's been doing sick in. Oh, man started. There's been one-day races. I mean, I don't know. Where do we begin with it all? I'll probably even forget in one or two things in there, even. But should we go with Provence, I guess, to start with? Uh, Mess Pulse and Wig. Dominating. I mean, we would spoke about him last week doing well at Etoile del Bessage. He's actually also chasing the, well, chasing Rolf Sørensen. I don't know if you guys know who he is. Kind of Denmark's mess person of the 90s in a way. So he's chasing his all-time winning record, which is about 56 wins. He's getting closer, but still a few wins to go. Yeah, I mean, you and you love France. What happened? Okay, so um, Tour de la Provence, a race I hold very dearly in my heart. Uh, on day one, it was a little time trial on Marseille, which was won by Mass Pacing of Lidl Track. Interestingly, second place went to a Swedish rider, Jakob Söderqvist, who I'd not heard of before. He snuck into second place. He's just signed with Little Track from sort of obscurity. He's 20 years old, so good result for him. The next day, stage one, um, was won by Mass Pacing again, with Alex Zangler or Zingler in second place, and Riley Pickrell in third. He had a bit of a breakout uh, towards the end of last year. He won a stage of the, the total uh, last year, so uh, he's making waves for Israel Premier Tech. It was a good week for them, but on stage two at Manosk, it was won by Mass Payson again with the hilly sort of stage there, with Zingler finishing in second place again. Zingler has promised a lot of good results, usually in these smaller French races. The next stage, the final one from Aul to, sorry, from Rognac to Aul, a, a city I absolutely love. If you're going to France, go to Aul. It's like, sorry, more tourism talk. Uh, but it's like the artisty city in, in the south of France. And um, a lot of people move out of Paris to go to Arles in the summer. And it's got like this really cool festival called the Rencontre de la Photographie. It's fantastic. You have to visit. It's also got a wonderful Roman amphitheater. They do bullfighting there. Vincent van Gogh used to paint a lot of his uh, pictures there. Anyways, Tom van Asperg won there. Ahead of Sam Bennett in second place. And Alex Zingler once again in third. This meant overall Mass Payson took the win. Uh, 29 seconds of Alex Zingler and Raul Garcia, who writes for Arkea BB Hotels. Fourth place went to Damien Tuzé, which has an awful surname in French. Um, his name is weird um, tangent. His surname is also very similar to the French word for an orgy. Um, so whenever I see his name, like I just think like Damien Orgy. Besides the point, uh, fifth place was Alex Kirsch of uh, Little Track again. So good week, Little Track. Three riders in the top ten with uh, Jakob Sadekvist in eighth place as well. And guys, I know we spoke about it, but I completely forgot that Sam Bennett moved to the to the Catalan Ash But um, uh -huh. he had a couple uh, yeah. decent top tens this week as well. He was a bit of a surprise this week. Well, I don't know. Yeah, he was a surprise. It's just been torrential weather throughout that whole race to the point where stage one which was really stage two because there's prologues but you know i love all that stuff with when there's a prologue the time gaps were like the gc times was taking at 5k to go because it was just so torrential and it was a technical running so all the time gaps were taking at 5k to go the other note then it i kind of thought you know he got beaten by tom van Asper. 
like, I mean, come on. Like, it's, I'm not saying this is like, it's not the end for Bennett. Like, he's still getting used to a team and a team which isn't especially known for sprinting. So, I'm not really taking too much from it. But do you expect to see Bennett at the tour this year? Or do you think that, like, he's just going to be relegated to doing just like stage races? He should get a Grand Tour. Yeah, he should get a Grand Tour star for sure. Like, at that team, it's it's kind of hard to see who else would really be up there and like a Grand Tour star list apart from it, Ben O'Connor, but we believe he might be going to the g -Dot. Ben O'Connor, by the way, who took a win this week, we're probably not going to talk about that one, so let's just give him a little bit of praise because it's a pretty small race. But um, yeah, he should be there. But I just don't, you know, this is the capital on Ashes. Uh, they've never really sort of had a sprint train. So like, I'm not expecting them to send like a full sprint train to a Grand Tour to support him. I don't think he'll get a stage win this year at a Grand Tour, but a couple top fives would be definitely progress from where he was last year in Bora. You're not counting Samuel Dumoulin. Um, is he still there? I know. I think he's retired. But I mean, um, in terms of recent... Did he uh, ever win a Grand Tour stage? Probably not, but Sam Bennett is down for Paris Nice. Well, UAE tour and then Paris Nice. So they haven't really, they haven't coming out with any team if he's going to the Giro tour, or whatever. So but, um, before, before we carry on, Samuel de Milan has won a Grand Tour stage. He won a sprint stage in Nantes, uh, where him, Omar Fayou, and William Fishcorn um, sprinted it out between themselves. Samuel de Milan was just a, it just kind of hit me out like a bit of a blast from the past. I don't know. So Bennett. If he gets sent to the Giro, there's so many sprints in there already. I'll just be kind of rubbish. But I don't know. I feel like I've hijacked this the whole Bennett discussion. It's not even really what we were, we were wanting to talk about. It was more Pedersen we wanted to talk about. I mean, like you say, we talked about him last week and his prospects of winning a monument. Obviously, he didn't win all four stages. He lost to Tom Van So obviously, Pedersen is now washed officially. Um, as is everybody else who's finished behind Tom Van Asbrook. Pedersen was so good. Like, he was at times isolated and still just rode on the front on that stage two, and then just still won anyway in a sprint. Like, not even close. I was like, how is this guy in such good form? I mean, if he's going to, like, a, if he's going to the opening weekend, which I'm not sure if he is, because obviously on loop is only a few weeks away from the day of recording, might be 13 days, something like that. It'll be less than two weeks by the time that it goes out. But Edson's going there, he'd be really dangerous. But he's definitely looking like a guy who's in such good form right now. He's, you know, a San Reino is definitely on the cards, I think. That, yeah, that's that's his next race. That's his next race, apparently. San, San Remo. Remo. Yeah, apparently. He'll mm. probably be drum dumped into something in between. Surely Kerna and um, yeah, true. On, on low. He's won Kerna in the past, right? Maybe I lied. Can he did in 2021. Just there we go. Woo. Yeah, you're right. Well done, you. They Woo. all merge into a, each other in a way. So now this begs back. the question: Will Maz Pearson win a Grand Tour? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Well, we we did the discussion last week about that, so I feel like mess pillars. And it, it, did they add anything this win in terms of our discussion last week? Whether because there wasn't a Wild Venard, there wasn't a Match One Paul, there wasn't a Tadej uh, to be devil's yeah. advocate. But it's quite funny when you watch, like, look at the previous winners of this race, and you have Nairo Quintana, Ivan Souza, and now mess pillars and unique list. Yeah, there wasn't really like a big mountain stage this year, which I think did kind of kill it a little bit. There, I say. Um... But it's, I, I think what this shows is that like Pearson is kind of slept on as like a time trialist as well. I know that pro logging field wasn't like super high. I mean, Jakob Söderqvist finished in second place, just mentioning his name again. Um, Sweden mentioned, um, and like he, he, he is a really, really strong time trialist. I think we sometimes forget this about him. Like for a yeah. prologue, boom, top five. I think he should like be beginning like a grand tour in that kind of list. Too bad we don't have any prologues at the Giro or the Tour. I'm not sure how many of the like the the big whatever six or whatever are going to all the monuments. A lot of them are going to Liège. I swear, quite a few of them are like just bailing on Rwanda and San Remo and stuff. I can basically, I think I saw something earlier this week. Somebody said, oh, you know, Vanderpool's just a lock basically to win all these because he's just like the only one going. But I don't know. I think Pedersen could provide some pretty serious competition. Like it wouldn't surprise me if he 
like podium like Ronda because Ada is not going. Um, he'll probably beat Wout. So then it's only like Matthew who he has to worry with. So it's like a podium's almost like a lock for Pedersen if you take where he's at at the moment. It's just a beating Vanderpool is going to be the main thing. I think it's definitely, of course, we haven't really seen Van der Poel doing anything. I think he was, I don't know, probably skiing last time I saw him. I think somebody said he was playing golf, which is a little bit concerning, but, you know, it, he, he is the king. After all, he can do what he wants. But Pedersen to be in, I don't know, hasn't happened before yet, I don't think, so I'm, I'm apprehensive to, you know, blow too much smoke, smoke up Pedersen's Really. I mean, that's a good place to finish. Plenty of races to get through as well. From king to king, I guess. Uh, king of Belgium, Remco Menopole, won a uh, race as well, attacking from 55, 53 kilometers out. Well, no one was really in touch. I think Isaac Del Toro got close at one point, but uh, eventually he won with, oh, well, almost two minutes uh, down to second place. Uh, did you guys watch this race? I mean, you and told us before recording that this is actually a new race, so it's not like we didn't know it existed it's a brand new race in portugal and we know how many portuguese fans there are as well so why not have a a big race other than just the Walter algarve and the Walter uh portugal which is still a 2.1 race i think the longest race i think outside of grand tours mm, okay in all fairness there was an edition last year but i mean second edition is practically new yeah the, there are some interesting results there with uh, eight level winning Vito Brat in second place, uh, one of the riders from Antimarche. I didn't, he really wasn't on my radar to get a podium at this race, but he he was up there. Mark Hirschi finished in top ten as well, Woo! doing doing what he's he does best, which is sort of second stroke third tier one day races. Um, but I mean, this is just an Avon Nepal victory, isn't it? Like my hot take is that Avon Nepal is like kind of boring sometimes. Like Liège last year, boring race. Once Pogacar crashed out, Liège the year before, boring. Like. He just sometimes just wins when he's, like, really strong. World Championships was boring when he was in it as well. Like, you know, seeing someone attack with 50k to go and win all the way to the end, like, it's just a bit of a snooze fest, to be honest. But he's winning again. He's the first of the big guys to start winning this year, I think. Probably. I mean, that's not hard. That's only been one month of racing. Stephen Williams? True. Oh, come on. Anybody else? Come off it. Um, But... It's it's impressive for him. He's now on fifty one victories for a guy who's just twenty four years of age. I think you are right. Whenever Haven Paul wins, like remove of Welter from that equation, um, his all of his victories are either like it's easy or they're just some big solo attack and we know the result with like an hour of racing left to go. So like he's incredibly efficient. Even did this a tour of Denmark when he won that. Like yeah. that was just escaping away yeah. on. This is legit. Just a twenty nineteen result. <laughs> he just attacked. It was like pure junior Remco all over again. And I guess because there weren't any other like Galacticos in there, that he was able to do that because you know if there isn't this stiff competition, Group Two tactics come into play real quick, and nobody wants to chase down the Belgian Aero Bullet who is also. In case anybody forgot the World Time Trial champion, you know, you're going to need three men on the front to start to bring him back. So, yeah, I mean, Remco, he's going to Baltimore to Algarve next week. He's probably the favourite to win that because soon it's got TT in there. Pitcock's I mean, there as well. He's Baltimore. won it twice. Oh, yeah, shoot. Exactly. You bring up something. I mean, I want to talk a bit more about Remco. So I'll talk about the Pitcock thing a bit later because he took a KOM, very famous one in Calpe. Sticking on Remco, how do you st- stop this? You said three riders on the front, but there was plenty of teams there, but couldn't really handle it. Is it just like, well, we saw it at the Worlds where the, well, there's no radio at Worlds, but is it just like Tade at Liège or Roglic or whoever, they have to be on his wheel all the time? Because if you if he gets 10 meters, you're not going to see him again. Because like you said, incredible engine, world time trial champion, and so aerodynamic. Yeah, that that's really it. To be to be honest, it's just I think those guys have to sort of stick with them. We've seen time and time again that like it's hard for teams to bring him back. And whether that be the Tour of Poland, whether that be the World Championships here in this one day race in Portugal or Liège, Bastogne, Liège, it's so hard for these guys to bring him back. So just 
has to kind of be someone following him on his wheel. And we've seen guys try to follow him as well who aren't quite in that Galactico bracket, like Pickcock at uh, Liège. And it just hasn't quite worked out for them, so... It, it, it really is bleak, but he's just got such good sort of brute force on him that he makes winning this easy. Yeah, exactly. It's a bit like, you know, again, with Pedersen saying, like, he's been doing super good this week, but, well, last two weeks. But it's because the competition's not that, like, even the ball didn't have competition here. Um, is he going to easily clean up our car? Because there isn't, well, what else there, to be fair? So maybe that like reads him out. Somebody's out of my word. Competition can't hack it. But if there isn't a big out for a Roglic, a Jonas there, then it's just so easy for Remco to just deploy back to 2019 and just, just ping it off the front with an hour of racing. Gets 30 seconds. And then 30 seconds becomes a minute. And then at that point, the race is gone. I think that, you know, the only problem will come when he gets to the top because then there's every good person there and he won't be able to do that. So, Merco's just like the king of, oh, this is going to make some people mad. He's the king of just like really mopping up when the competition's not very great. And that's just great facts. Fair enough. I mean, looking at uh, you and Jorn, uh, with, <laughs> it's almost cycle cross territory for you and here. So, yeah. I mean, um, I'm sorry. I, I it's this <laughs> I, this week has been very hard on my body. Um, yesterday, a bit of you and law. I did the sub crawl. Uh, so Glasgow has a subway line. It's just got one around the city, and there's a pub crawl you can do where you have a beer at every subway stop. Oh. So I did that yesterday, and my body feels like a war zone. My body feels like stage nineteen of the 2019 Tour de France. Um, yeah. I, thanks for that. I'm not did I'm that not, very. Good image thanks i've actually got <laughs> actually got uh, uh the, the the newspaper cover from from that stage in the background over there but i feel really really rough so i'm sorry if i'm not quite my usual self today you can probably tell the fact that my my voice sounds like i've i don't know swallowed a cheese grater anyway i mean what i wanted to talk about with pitcock uh, is that he apparently took the kom for the colder rats or the Calderates, however you say it, Calderade in Danish, but I don't know how you say it in Spanish. This is, for context, the climb the most pros use when they incalculate to kind of gauge their form, etc., etc. This is also the climb where a young Jonas Vingor took the KOM in 2018, I believe, and as a result of that, well, there was many other factors as well. That's why Jumbo signed him. And uh, Juan Ayuso took it in the 31st of December last year. And now Tom Pickock is taking 30 seconds out of his time. So my question is, is Tom Pickock just phenomenal? Is he going to win the tour now? Because is he going to finish on the podium at the Vuelta España? No. Oh, God. Probably not. <laughs> That's I'm Yorkshiremen saying, saying this. They're going to take your citizenship for this. Can't come back in Yorkshire after this. If you stay in the Lake District. The Lake District. I'm defected. <laughs> defected to Cumbria. I don't know. I, I I would love to get on the hype with it. I really would. But I mean, you, you can take one thing from it. Uh, obviously, the fact that he's taking it is a sign that he's got really good legs. Fantastic. You know, that, that is an absolute tick in the box. Good stuff, it is. But it's just like. People could like if it's if that's the only effort he did on the day and he like completely fresh, you know, you you could probably take it and take that 30 seconds. Whereas, you know, a Yuzo, I think he did it like once before and then did it and then took the KOM afterwards. So it's kind of like what's the repeated effort kind of you know, this would be very similar to Pitcock rolls up with a ball, UAE again, rubbish race, goes up to down on that cluster on Jabal Piffy and then just like insane what's per kilo everybody overreads it and then he gets spat out of the tour because there's not just one climb in a lot of tall mountain stages there's like multiple ones and it's the accumulation of the effort which makes them harder you know as I don't know after you know Galibier last uh, in 2022 that was the thing which really cracked him not necessarily the final climbs the accumulation so i would look I, i'm 
don't get me wrong, it's obviously in great form, but I think we need to see more from like the the multiple mountain stages. Uh, and that I think that all give us a better indication as to what kind of GC contender is. But I think it's definitely a step up from last year. Yeah, I, like that. This probably isn't enough of, of, a, of a sign to say that he's going to win a Grand Tour. Let's be real. Um, well, Pingo won two and he slower time. But he used to have one any. Ouch. Exactly. Um, also, Van Gogh got it in 2018. Come on, that was like before. That was f- four years before he won a Tour de France. I don't know. Pickcock, as you say, these long mountain days, he just seems to struggle on them too much. I don't think he's quite up there in the upper echelon in terms of his time trialing yet. Yeah, I, I think his schedule's hard with the mountain biking, focus, cyclocross, and doing Grand Tours. We've never really seen this before. We see guys do these different disciplines like that in the pool, but then not do a Grand Tour. It's such a different frame, it's such a different build, and also just the timings of it all. Cyclocross works because in the winter, mountain biking season is quite like summer focused, and if he's focusing on Grand Tours, then he can't really balance our both. So as much as Ineos Grenadiers would love him to be their new Grand Tour force and how much they're allegedly paying, according to that Gazzetta Dello Sport article, it would make a lot of sense for him to be a Grand Tour contender, but I just do not see it, to be honest. I think baby steps, even a top 10 at a Grand Tour, He's now done two, not reached top 10 either time. He was close in 2022, but for him to be in a discussion about winning a Grand Tour, he needs to finish in top 10 first. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just if him back to the... What, what stages of, like, the mountain stages in this fall last year did Peacock do well in? It was Grand Colombia, one climb, and it was with the dot, where there was just, like, one climb at the end of the day. So, <laughs> sorry Patrick I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this but just you did a thumbs up I can I don't know what this is but on screen they just put a big thumbs up emoji did they? yeah <laughs> just for me <laughs> it's hilarious it's silly. does it work with, with like with the thumbs down as well what? no it doesn't oh, oh! No, it doesn't. this is there fantastic we go. sorry anyway um Zoom features aside, Hitchcock did well on the mountain stages where there was just one climb in the day. At the end of the day, it's just like a watts per kilo bash. But when you get to the multiple mountains, that's where he started to struggle. So I think that's kind of like the natural next. That's the natural next step. So to say, uh, I I do think that he could finish top 10 of the sport this year. And I think Algar will be really interesting to watch to see how his TTs develop because there is a TT in there. So we'll see how he stacks up. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough with the pickup. Yeah, it is just one climb. And many of the big guys don't even upload their rides to Strava. So there might be faster times yeah. as well. Uh, alleged Remco did even faster apparently this year. So it's that all makes sense. <laughs> Allegedly, so did I. <laughs> I'm just coming up loads with it. I want to keep everyone humble. I want to make sure that everybody knows that I am the true person who is the heir to the throne of, like, you know. But it I is good signs. Form. It is good signs. Whatever. It's still. I've got such good form. I can actually do seven watts a kilo for like 80 minutes straight. It's just that no, I, I haven't uploaded it, guys. Not going to lie. If you went to the Giro, you could probably finish top 20 anyway, given its current start list. I What's mean, Pickcock should be there. Why not? Yeah. Anyways, UAE Tour has started as well. The Moscat Classic and the Women's Edition as well was won by favorite of the podcast as well, I have to say, by you two. How much of you did you guys watch it? And it looked like it was another Belgian dominance once again by a superstar. The superstar. Yes, sure. It was the UAE Women's Tour. UAE Tour Women. Um, ironic, I know. Um, Lorena Weebus took stage one in Dubai Harbor. Lorena Weebus took stage two <laughs> again on stage three at Jabal Hafid. It was uh, Lotta Kopecky who took that one ahead of Neve Bradbury and Mavi Garcia in third place. And finally, on stage four, Amber Krak took the stage win for Francis Deja Suez. Uh, not related to the men's team, despite um, what the name suggests. Uh, overall, Lotta Kopecky took the win, the world champion in that rainbow jersey of hers, with Neve Bradbury in second place, Mavi Garcia in third, and little, little Gaia Riolini finished in fourth place. I watched it. Don't get wrong, I did actually watch it. Four people call me a or something. I actually did. This is actually some of the 
first pre-sync what I watched live, wouldn't leave us. Even though I've said that I don't want to you eat all. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, when SC works rock up to a race, it kind of just makes every other team, because they have the fastest sprint, I was, was going to do a bump up again, I was going to trigger the emoji. How they've got the fastest sprinter in Bieber's, and they've got the best classics rider in Kapeki. And it now turns out that Kapeki is now one of the best climbers in the whole women's peloton. So nobody could catch a break. It's not even like you could be like, oh, well, Bollowing isn't here, so we're, we're safe. It's like, no, you're not. You're not safe at all. Because now I got Kapeki. I thought it was insane. Kapeki. He won. It was it was pretty and it was a phenomenal performance, and I did not expect it to happen at all. Like she did, just insane work to just hang in there and then just out sprint Neve Bradbury at the top. I was just like, wow. I mean, chapeau because that was incredible. And Kopecky was fully set for another classics winning campaign. But I think the more interesting part is her climbing. I mean, she did show it at the tour last year. She finished top 10 GC in the Tour de France. Found it wouldn't surprise me if she finished on the podium this year, to be honest with you. I think the course is quite suited to her. I know it finishes up after Les, but that opening week's got quite a lot of flatter rolling terrain. I, I, honestly, I do think that Volring and Kopecky could both be on the podium uh, coming, I was going to say, into Paris, but it's it doesn't, it doesn't go into Paris. No, it starts in, in the Netherlands and it's like sticking to the French border like glue um, until it gets to the Alps. But I mean, you mentioned volunteering that that is a bit of a sort of a sticky situation because they're, they're both on the same team. Like if if they weren't on the same team, you could probably say that she's got a better chance of winning the, the, the Tour de France. But like, I also think Tour de France is probably the easiest out of all the Grand National, the Walter probably is easier. But um it's one of the easier grand tours to win for the women. And I think, yeah, if, if, if Volering wasn't on the same team, she'd definitely have, have a really good shot to sort of lead um, a squad. But I just don't think Kopecky has that leadership experience yet in sort of a week-long stage race. This was only four days, and I had sort of one decisive stage in these week-long stroke grand tours. There are more stages, and I think that leadership role is, is more important, and she hasn't done that in that kind of format before. She's great at sort of leading the Classics team and one day stuff, but um, it'd be interesting to see if she can slot into that role. She's been performing so, so well so far, and last year at the, at the Tour de France was incredibly impressive, but she wasn't the leader there. She was kind of un, under the wing of Lotte Kopecky. Sorry, I mean Demi Bollare. My bad. Freudian slip. <laughs> I just wonder how your team's lining up for that race when they're facing Capecchi, Wallering, Marlon Rosa, Vivas, Blanca Vaz, plus two others. I think they're allowed to team seven. Like nobody stands in shot of it of, of even getting a look in. Like it's not even like there's a, a Van Vleuten anymore to provide that sort of intrigue. It's almost just like a done deal before we even rock up to the start list. Maybe Little Trek could spice things up with Longo Borghini and Gary Lini. True, but if Chappelle or Fee's anything to go by, I could have got spat. Mm. It is still fe- it is February, though. Like, just because you're going well in February doesn't mean you're going well in July. So Take that, it's- room Venipo. Exactly. People who win crits in February don't win them in July. It's a well-proven fact. I mean, we, we have quite a long program already i mean next coming to one of the races that i will really want it back on the calendar is back at toro colombia did a preview of it last week but in terms of um respectable we've seen wins by gaviria wins by uh, mark camdish taking a win as well very good lead out by astana then we had uh, the colombian national champion taking a stage win as well then Yesterday, well, yesterday for us on time of recording was Richard Carapaz taking a win, but not taking the overall jersey. And we also saw big slip ups from Nairo Quintana. But uh, Aleti Lutsenko, the favorite of the podcast, what a ride by him. Probably, well, Harold Hada took a win as well, but he was probably doing a lot of work to kind of get the services of Harold Hada locked in for the Tour de France. But uh, yeah, what have you kind of made of? the uh, Colum- tour of Colombia no tour Colombia and uh, do you think Nairo is 
basically, as Patrick would say, washed. First of all, stupid name. Name it Tour of Colombia. Name it Vuelta Colombia. I know they're different races, but Tour Colombia, it just looks a bit uncomfortable as a native speaker of English. Yeah, I mean, it's been cool to see see some, some uh, big names win. Finally, Gaviria's got a, a win again. It's been such a long time. And Cavendish as well. And I mean, Tejada, I've always felt has been like a little bit overrated by us. But now he's kind of proved it. He's proved that, that he's kind of the real deal. I mean, back to Cavendish, that sprint train looked really, really good. So... <sighs> do I have to dig up the debate again about will he win that stage? Because In your face, Eddie Merckx is coming. It's coming. Yes, I'm so tired of, of having this discussion every time Mark Cavendish does well. Can, can he win this Tour de France stage? <laughs> I was really looking forward to never having to talk about it again last year after the Tour de France, but now we're having to talk about it for a whole other seven months. So, oh, please just do it. Please just... Fine. And is Cavendish going to win a Tour de France stage? Let's do it. Ugh. Why is the tour in September this year? Oh, I can't do maths. I can't count. This but, is this is this is well documented on, on on the channel. I mean, you guys just went for Cavendish, and I was asking about Nido Man, uh, who didn't look great, uh, to be honest. Oh, oh, yeah, let's, uh, let's start with the negatives. Is there anything to say, really? He he had the year suspension. Or couldn't find a team or whatever didn't want to go down on continental yeah. and uh here in his home tour they all say that this is like the tour de france for the, the colombian riders didn't quite live up to where he was ef looked brilliant by the way they had who was it they had uh cepeda i think up there they had chavez attacking looking quite lively and then richard carapaz really just doing well and casado their former ef guy was up there as well so uh maybe someone should sign him israel uh, movie star anyone yeah um also i mean we're going for quintana but i think Edgar bernal as well has not quite been looking as good as he should be he was fourth the national team he's a former tour de france champion yeah okay know, fair enough he, like almost you know no, died again i didn't want to say the d <laughs> word but yes um um i was expecting more maybe i'm just a cynical person but I was expecting a little bit more from him. And what I find interesting is that Rodrigo Contreras is leading this race. Whilst Carapaz, yeah. Uran, Bernal, all here. Like, great Grand Tour riders, all podiumed uh, big races before. Um, Contreras, a guy who was sort of evaporated from the world tour level about three years ago after COVID, just suddenly jumped into the into the frame here with a really good chance of winning this race. It is absolutely wild how... Yeah, he's like he's he's leading. Jonathan Caicedo is second, and then Carapaz is in third or something like that. And going into like the final stage, wow, it's just mental how these guys from was it like yeah like the some continental whatever team now that they ride for are fully beating world tour level climbers. And I know I've just said it's February. You know, people who are winning in February don't aren't winning in July, but still, you know, it's cool, it's cool to see these names from, you know, the past of World Tour, reminding us that they still exist. I, I really like it. But if Although, this is their high point, they're going to peak for this. Whereas Carapaz, he doesn't care about Tour of Colombia yeah, exactly. in that sense. Like his yeah. goal is the Tour de France, so maybe that's yeah. yeah but he's here. You know, he's going to yeah. want to race. But yeah, I mean, I do agree. But then at the same time, it's a guy who just, he's at the continental level, you know, hasn't been at the world tour level for a number of years. It's like, wow, he's he's still here. Um, but I mean, back to Quintana. I've heard some people say that he could podium the Giro. Is that too ambitious, do you think? Maybe. I think given this, I mean, like you were saying, like, people come here to race. It's not like Carapaz was doing fine. Lots of the other kind of world tour level guys are doing fine. Why is Quintana getting spat so hard? It's like it's not like he's just coming in here just to kind of I don't know just take the mic and just parade around. It's like surely you'd hope for a bit more from yourself than being thrashed around by some continental level people. I think it is a little bit concerning to me. It's kind of like the year out has really taken a toll on. And again, I know it is for Colombia, and maybe it's just like too much to read into it but is it is it not a little bit concerning that him as a world tour level climber who is being touted to be in some people's eyes like you and said 
contending with a podium of the Giro d'Italia this year, is it not a bit concerning that he's doing just utterly awful at this race? As you'd think he'd be doing better. And bear in mind, this is a guy who has performed well at this race in the past when he was World Tour. Yeah. It is definitely worrying to see this. And I mean, Movistar will be sort of regretting their choices potentially by bringing Quintana back, back into their ranks because, uh, yeah, it really hasn't been up there and being competitive at all. San Casero, Movistar. Go on, do it. Well, literally, they should do. They I wish, they could, do. Um, um, wish they could do a trade yeah, like, yeah. You know, like American is, sports. Is there a clause in the contract? Uh, if you're lower yeah. than top three, then we can yeah. get rid of you. Get Contreras in there as well, who's, who's obviously doing well. You know, why not? The also, the other concerning thing is that Quintana did really bad in the National Champs TT, uh, of which there are two TTs in the Giro, and he will therefore be losing literal. I mean, what? what how, how many minutes down do you reckon? How many minutes is Quintana going to lose to Pagacha in those TTs? Four minutes, maybe? Half an hour. Half an hour? I mean, okay. Let's say it's, look, look, we'll split the difference, but I've maybe <laughs> five minutes. He ain't getting him that back with Pagatcha. There's no way. I know that the theory isn't to beat Pagatcha, but there's going to be people there who's doing, you know, negating my time better than Quintana is. Movistar have made a blunder here so far, and uh, they're going to be hoping for more, for sure, from a guy who's won to, like, Grand Souls in the past. Just, yeah, hopefully he does better. But I mean, he is also a guy who raced in a very different era of cycling. But I am going to be a little bit sort of optimistic, dare I say. Like, the Bogacha riding style, like, like the aggressive style is like, although Quintana rode in a very boring time for GC, I think he was one of the more daring and attacking riders, but to the go longer, doesn't mind going solo. So maybe that style will help him against... The other contenders for second, third, fourth place, maybe not Pogaccia, but like the guys who are trying to sort of emulate Pogaccia, even if they're going to be like a couple minutes down on him, it could be uh, interesting to see how he reacts with all these guys that he hasn't really raced with in the past. That year out and also just not being on the world tour level before for a couple of years has definitely taken him out of that top tier of racing. And he hasn't ridden a grand tour that isn't the Tour de France in a while. I mean, you always talk about Nairo Quintana all day. Um, the tour of Colombia is almost finishing as well. But right over the week, we have all the races. Ooh. Wait, what? What is that? What? I mean, the, the tour of a man has started, but that's not really why I wanted to go to. Yeah, it. but I, I um, was thinking we cover that next week. Can I say you... the D word? The D word. Demo. Doping. Oh, oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, go uh, for it. There's a big doping investigation happening right now. Um. Right. It's it's not looking good. Two riders have had uh, issues, state, um, well, statements issued by the UCI this week. First of all, the Cardinal Age Desaires, Fon Bon Amour. This one breaks my heart. Frankie Goodloving, as his name translates to, his bio passport didn't quite link up in one of his samples. And then later in the week, Antoine Tolhug as well got flagged up. I thought that I thought the tall hook one was interesting because he did sort of disappear from the world tour, riding for a continental team at the moment. But uh, we don't know what's going to happen. F former teammates have like made sort of statements on social media, like saying that he would never do this. But I mean, people are going to do that. People are going to say things like that. Uh, we don't know anything for sure yet in terms of the further investigation. But these two statements coming out this week is worrying for the weeks to come. Also, I had no idea Antoine Tolduc used to write for Tinkoff Saxo as a child back in 2015. Who knew? I don't want to say it's funny, but the timing that Antoine Tolduc now rides for that Portuguese, what was like glass, dri or glass drives, but it's not anymore. And the fact that he went to a Portuguese team, which, you know, in pre previous years, Portuguese teams, W52, all those people, there was a little bit of a thing. He literally went to that team, and the day it happened, this happened. I'm not saying the two are related, but it's just really quite humorous timing that those two things happen. Obviously, it's not humorous that he's been flagged up for this. Yes, it is a little bit concerning that these there's been two cases. You know, usually we're used to a sporadic, you know, one or two, like, you know, a Hessman kind of, you know, dabbling. 
every so often, but yeah, two in one week, especially on the world tour level as well. Um, I'm not sure what's happened. Maybe the UCI are putting in another test. Maybe they're kind of looking for a different biomarker or something in people's samples. I don't really know. So maybe they've just set up something and they've just caught two people. Don't know. Uh, but hopefully we don't get any more. We just kind of, it just remains nice and squeaky clean for the rest of the year. Yes, let's hope. I also don't want to see Bonamore wiped out of the world tour level. That would make me very, very sad. I mean, thanks, Ian, for bringing the mood down. So uh, we'll have to bring it up with Ride of the Week. We haven't covered GPL Miri as well, won by Olaf Koi. Yeah, we also like Toraman stages being won by sprinters in the form of Caleb Ewan and someone else. Can't quite remember. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, plenty of favorites in terms of podcast favorites. So, uh, we also even had the tour of Itali- Italia in Turkey as well. So, yeah. Who are you guys going to give your rider of the week to this week? Um, I'm going to go with Ben Fisher Black for winning the Muscat Classic and also for winning stage two of a tour of Oman. You know, we had. Finn's been kind of, I think, developing the last couple of years. And I think I was really looking forward to seeing a couple of breakout performances this year. And I do think that we're already getting glimpses of that. He was okay in tour down under, but feeling a little bit ill, apparently. But yeah, winning the Muscat Classic was just insane. You know, he's he's quite a large, you know, he's like a ruler kind of type. So that was just really impressive to see. And then he also, you know, put people in the freaking hurt locker on stage two, which is an uphill finish. And it wouldn't surprise me if he was top three, maybe top five at the end of the week for Oman. For so I'm very much looking forward to seeing what he's going to do this week. Mm. Yeah, he won a really nice stage of the GRT Sicilia last year as well. Yeah. Um, looked super good there. Also, shout out to Pig and Zoli who won um, the Tour of Antalya uh, for Polti Cometa. But he's not my ride of the week. Ugh, there's a really obvious one. Okay, I'm gonna go. Um, but the obvious one, I think, I feel like Scott's gonna take. I can be contrarian, so I'm just gonna piss you off. My ride of the week is is Mass Payson, um, because I think no, I genuinely think Payson. Like I said this last week as well. If he were around in a different generation, then he would be his praises would be sort of sung a hell of a lot more. He's a fantastic rider, super versatile. Um, just it's a shame that he's. Riding against Van der Poel, Van Aert, and these kind of guys, because otherwise, I think he'd be a bit of a generational talent. Scott, sorry, now you have to rethink it. Wow. Okay, my rider of the week is Alberto Bessio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Grazie mille. I mean, I can't pick him because I don't. Be so happy when when you make me rider of the week. Okay. Uh... <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go. Well, he didn't win a race, but just for because he was podcast favorite and he absolutely put the herd locker on and for whatever reason Astana wanted to isolate Ta- uh, Haro Tahada instead of keeping him and whatever so uh, Alex Lexi Lotsenko uh, I'll give him right of the week but I mean Ooh. Richard Carapaz could have had her as well but uh, yeah it's Alexi Lotsenko season baby yeah it's coming it's coming that top five in the tour maybe not uh, <laughs> not this year <laughs> Go to the Giro and let's see. We know you watch this podcast, hopefully. Um, but yeah. Well, <laughs> Whoa, that... guys, the tone was going up, but now it's back. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. But I mean, uh, any any final thoughts? Um, gosh, rank be is coming up soon. Oh, sorry. Go again. Go again. Um, Grand Camino is coming up soon, so looking forward to that. And this Algarve at Roots del Sol and finishing up Oman next week. So we've got so much racing to get through, but better than no racing. Yeah, that's true. Well, anyways, with that, that's basically it for this. Uh, well, episode 55. If you haven't already, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel as well, because that really helps. And get involved in the comments. We really do appreciate the funny comments as well. And uh, yeah, we'll do a comments section next week, I think. Check us out on. Uh, various podcasts as well but with that as always thank you very much for watching we really appreciate it and we will see you next week